Welcome to the FanDuel Running Back Analysis for Week 3. I'm Jason Gilbo, J. Gilbo 11. With me is Justin Elick at Big Italy 42. Uh, you broke down running backs this week for FanDuel, cash, GPP, and value. And uh, you also kind of highlighted in your intro here, it was just kind of an abysmal week for injuries. Man, it was a rough week. I was one of the – I don't. I wouldn't say many, but I was all in on Danny Woodhead because I love Danny Woodhead. And it was just a perfect spot for him to rack up a ton of catches – um, plenty of carries too. And I mean, he's the guy that killed me the most. Um, fortunately I didn't have any Adrian Peterson. Um, I had Rashad Jennings, but what well, it's kind of too soon to talk about how the giants screwed everybody last week. But, um, yeah, it was just, it was just a rough week. I mean, and anybody who's got season long teams, every single person got affected by some of these injuries. I mean, I had Martin and Woodhead on most of my teams and they're all screwed now, but that's why we love DFS because we don't have to worry about all that crap and uh, we can just kind of scrap those teams and worry about them later. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, every week's obviously week two. If you went all in on Woodhead, you're probably like hating DFS because I, I was at the end of week two. But cash game guys here for week three, looking at Danjo Williams, uh, his last week here before he kind of takes a little bit of a back seat. Um, but obviously his price bumped up, but he's definitely worth it because he's just a workhorse. Yeah, I mean, FanDuel finally realized that he was the highest volume. I mean, he was, he's was he been the highest volume running back. He's been the most productive running back. I mean, I feel like any above-average talent put into that Pittsburgh system is going to just produce at a ridiculously high level. DraftKings hadn't, hasn't really changed his price quite as much. I mean, he's still up there, but he's, I think David Johnson's more expensive. But, I mean, he's as safe of an option as you're going to get. Obviously, you see the Eagles. It looks like their defense has been pretty good, but – we're not going to be fooled by that. They played the Bears and the Browns so far, so any team's going to kind of have skewed numbers with that. But uh, D'Angelo Williams has 68 touches in the first two weeks um, against two defenses. I, I think both of them are at least as good or better than the Eagles' defense. And, I mean, it's just kind of simple in, the, in this regard in cash games. You just play D'Angelo Williams like you should have been doing the last two weeks, like most people did the last two weeks. You lock in that safety, and you don't really worry about the price tag because there's so much value everywhere else that why not lock in the guy that's going to touch the football as much, if not more, than anyone else? And, I mean, he's got some upside there as well. Yeah, he definitely does. And as you mentioned, I mean, it, it works nice because there are value wideouts, there are value QBs, whoever you want to roll with to kind of pair with him. So I'm not worried about the price either. Uh, next guy you talk about here is C.J. Anderson, uh, 8K, who's kind of another workhorse. We don't really see it too often nowadays, but Anderson's going to be the guy who you can just kind of rely on for 20-plus touches. Yeah, I mean, there's like we mentioned, there's plenty of value guys. We'll get to those later, but not a whole lot of value guys that you know you can trust. Obviously, you got the Spencer Ware situation pretty much done with Jamal Charles in some capacity probably back this week. Um, Anderson, much like Williams, like you said, he's had exactly 20 carries, exactly five targets each of the first two weeks. I'm a, I'm a diehard Bengals fan, but I'm also not an idiot, and I realize that this has not been a good rush defense so far this season. The past defense has been – Pretty solid, um, very solid, actually, if you if you consider the types of receivers that they've, for the most part, shut down. But, I mean, they're very susceptible on the ground. Obviously, young quarterback and Trevor Simeon there, not a situation where you expect he's going to be passing the ball 30-plus times. They're going to be relying on the passing game, and, I mean, they should because this has just not been a very good defense for the Bengals. And safety-wise, if you if you just feel like you have to lock these guys in, you like a couple cheap wide receivers, which there are some, I mean, that, that's your safest bet. That was the duo I went with last week, and I don't see any reason to get away from it unless you're going to take a chance on one of these cheap guys in cash. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think paying up, I mean, I, I still think there's enough value at wide receiver, even if you wanted to fit a Brown in with one of these guys, you can do so. Um, and you just look here, as you mentioned, you you know the touches are going to be there for both those guys. We get down to the value a little later. We're not quite sure on that yet. There is a little bit yeah. of hesitancy. So um, in terms of GPPs here, interesting call with Matt Forte at 7,500, going up against the Chiefs defense, who also really hasn't looked that great against the run. Yeah, I mean, Matt Forte – a couple of years ago in that Bears offense, I mean, he was the safest play you could possibly get each week. He had monster upside, you know, with his ability to not only catch the ball in the short passing game, but, I mean, he can be productive with those catches. It's not one of those guys where, you know, you see – like a D'Angelo Williams type. He's going to catch a couple passes each week, but there's not 100-yard upside through the air. But there really is that with Matt Forte. Um, and, I mean, he's as reliable of an option as you're going to get, so he's got a nice floor. That team total for the Jets – We'll talk more about that in the other pods, but I think it's just way too low. The Chiefs are still an above-average defense, but 
not one that I'm scared of. And especially with Brandon Marshall, looks like probably game time decision, maybe won't play at all. There's going to be more to go around. You're going to see, I think, Forte be relied on a little bit more. I mean, he did score three touchdowns last week, but certainly probably won't see that again um, this entire season. But only two teams, Miami and Cincinnati, have given up more rushing yards than the Chiefs over the first two weeks. So I think Matt Forte is a really safe option. And obviously we saw his ceiling last week too. Yeah, and I think you're going to get him at a low ownership. Usually when guys come off big weeks, you know, a lot of the people kind of grasp to him and, and kind of go after him. But I don't think that's the case with Forte just because there's so many cheap options um, that people are going to be gravitating towards more. Uh, so I like that call quite a bit. DeMarco Murray is another guy at 7,700. Um, he's just been kind of an all-around back so far with Tennessee. Um, and in terms of looks, he's getting a ton of them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the guy that, you know, you look at your running backs and he's a guy who hasn't had a whole lot of carries, only 25 carries for, through the first two weeks, but um, does have 12 catches, 91 yards, two touchdowns. And we kind of saw this when he was in Dallas, you know, that short passing game, you get to the goal line and you can get really creative with Murray. He's a really versatile back. And, you know, the Titans still, Tajai Sharp has been good. They don't really have really consistent options in the passing game. So they're kind of going with the two-headed attack at running back still. And Murray's the guy that's got the upside. We've seen it before. And, um, you know, he's – I don't. I guess he's not really the focal point, I guess, because I feel like you'd have more touches as a focal point. But this is an offense that's still pretty balanced. Murray, obviously, if he's getting, you know, six catches a week, that right there gives you a nice floor. He gets red zone looks. And, I mean, the Raiders have been by far the worst defense in the NFL so far this season. And, I mean, I just don't really expect them to get any better this week. 47-point total, close spread. So, I mean, this could definitely turn into a shootout. And we know that, you know, DeMarco Murray certainly has that floor and upside. Yeah, definitely. I like him quite a bit this week. And as you mentioned, I mean, not the focal point, but it's pretty limited as far as what Tennessee can do. Because you do have Sharp, you do have Delaney Walker. But outside of that, it really is just Murray is kind of that, that option there. Uh, diving into value, Charles Sims, 6,300. Uh, we start to kind of get into where I think a lot of people are probably going to be head, headed this week. Um, and I like actually Martin. I think he's probably my favorite out of the value backs. Um, obviously, Melvin Gordon's going to be popular play as well. Yeah, I mean, Sims is the guy. He's, you know, getting a full point PPR. But, I mean, he's already a guy who catches a lot of passes. Um, Doug Martin, I mentioned here, averaged just over 20 touches a game last season, obviously. He's going to miss some contests. Um, Sims had 48, or I'm sorry, 78 targets dating back to the beginning of last year. So just over four a game. Now he's going to be the lead back. And it's a Rams defense that looked good last week, but we kind of mentioned it there too. They play well against Seattle, it seems. And I don't know what it is. They just match up really well against the Seahawks. And this is still defensive line, one of the better defensive lines in the game. But it's still not a overall defensive unit that I'm really trying to shy away from. And Sims, not quite so much as Spencer Ware the first week, but he's going to be a really popular option this week. So he's the kind of guy that, you know, if you're playing cash games, it kind of makes sense to lock him in there and uh, differentiate your lineups elsewhere because he should see plenty of touches. Jameis Winston's still wildly inconsistent after everyone jumped on his bandwagon after the first week. I mean, it's, it's Sims and it's Mike Evans, and I don't really have – much faith in anybody else in that offense. So I think the two of those guys are going to get a ton of looks this week. Yeah, I mean, you really look Vincent Jackson over the hill. Uh, their tight end situation really isn't that great. So I, I do think Sims getting a full-time role is certainly going to be worth the price. And as you mentioned, you do like him a little bit more on DraftKings with the full-point PPR. But I think even how we looked at Woodhead last week, we usually like him there as well. But he was just going to be such a high-volume guy that it makes sense on both sides. Yep. So, uh, Melvin Gordon, the next one here at 7,100. Obviously, he's been playing well for his first two weeks, had a decent half against the Chiefs until the kind of things went other ways in terms of game flow. Um, but last week, I mean, we saw him kind of be a, a dominant threat and gets a great matchup against the Colts, who were really just <laughs> not good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like we waited pretty much the entire season for him um, to ever score a touchdown. It was how many people did you see on Twitter last year saying this is the week Melvin Gordon gets a touchdown? Melvin Gordon's going to score next week. Look, four weeks from now, guaranteed he's going to score. And now he's got three touchdowns in the first two weeks. And, I mean, Brandon Oliver was already out. Danny Woodhead is out now. I mean, it's Melvin Gordon is going to be, I mean, I, you say workhorse, but 
I mean, he's going to see just as many carries as he possibly can. He's going to get touches. Not really much of a factor in the passing game so far this year. But, I mean, maybe he's going to be. I don't know who else they're going to throw the ball to in that short passing game. Did have three catches last week after not seeing any targets week one. But, I mean, safety-wise, I think he is just as good of an option as a guy like C.J. Anderson. And, like you mentioned, the Colts um, – Rest in peace their season already. Sorry to sorry for you, but that defense is just horrible right now. And anybody who's getting a good amount of looks, I mean, this is a situation you definitely want to take advantage of. And I think he's also going to be a pretty popular selection. So um, I don't feel particularly comfortable in cash games with any of the guys that we might mention here real quick in a minute. So I think that really the lowest I'm trying to pay, aside from Sims, is uh, Melvin Gordon this week in cash. Yeah, I think so, too. You look at that total, you look at that matchup, it's certainly better than all those kind of value guys, even though he is a little bit more expensive. Um, you do talk about Theo Riddick. You do talk about Posse Whitaker, Jay Ajayi, Jarek McKinnon. Um, McKinnon's the cheapest out of that one at 5,300. Um, but overall, I don't think anyone's uh, of those group are kind of as in a good a spot as Gordon is. Yeah, and I mean, that offensive line, I think it was uh, – I can't remember who it was that tweeted earlier. I'll try to find it here real quick. But I saw someone um, – let me find it. Oh, Evan Silva tweeted earlier, Pro Football Focus has every Vikings offensive lineman in negative for run blocking, and as a team, they're dead last with 1.9 yards to carry. So McKinnon, while he's talented and Matt Asiata is not, um, there's not a chance in hell I'm playing Asiata ever. If you ever see him on one of my lineups, you can go ahead and just block all my accounts because there's no way. But, I mean, that offensive line's terrible. Adrian Peterson couldn't even get any running room last week. And, I mean – you could take a chance in a GPP because he's obviously got that big play upside. But, I mean, I don't trust any of these guys in cash games. No, I don't either. I mean, Theo Riddick might be the closest one I do, but I just don't think you need to go that route with Gordon kind of right there, a couple hundred more. Um, but, yeah, I'm in the ground. I think what's more GPP swerves, if anything, it's, it's a pretty bold call because I don't think they're going to be really over 10% owned. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go wrap things up for this week with the FanDuel running back analysis. Be sure, be sure to check out the rest of our content at dailyfantasycafe.com.